We are in part seven of eight, part seven of our Knowing God series through the book of Job. And y'all know this is a year of wisdom. So I'm gonna tell you this every time. When you come to church, be prepared to learn. Be prepared to be engaged with something you're not familiar with, some way of looking at things new. Our goal is to try to jolt you out of current thinking and reconsider another way of looking at it. Well, in this Knowing God series, we're trying to look at God rightly. Now, none of us fully understand what God is like, right? We're all messed up. We all think things that are not true. But God's word gives us some indicators on how to look at him rightly. I think that if he walked into the room as we sing in worship, I think when he walks onto this stage, we would all say, wow, I had so much wrong in my head. That is not at all what I thought was going on. So none of us are being arrogant to say we know everything about it, but that's why we study the Bible, because he reveals himself over and over and over. So we're gonna do that again today. Now, for those of you that are brand new to our series through Job, here's the story. There was a righteous man. He was the best of the best. His name was Job. God and Satan get into a conversation about him, and Satan says, the only reason that guy is so awesome is because you protect him all the time. Let me add him, and I will show you what he's really like. God says, all right, you're allowed to test him. Satan takes away everything, all of his wealth, all of his children, destroys his marriage, wrecks his health. Everything is devastated in this guy. He's reduced down, he's sitting in ashes, weeping and crying out for months before God. In this completely weakened state, his friends, and in case you're listening on the radio, that was in quotes, his friends make everything worse because they're all telling him he must have done something wrong. So as everything is at its low point, he starts to lash out at God. He starts to say, God, you probably enjoy tearing me apart. You're the responsibility of all my suffering. And he goes on and on and on. Then one day, while he's complaining about God and talking about God, God shows up. How shocking and embarrassing is it when you're talking about him and you turn around and he's right there, right? That is where we pick up the story. Now, in order to do that, I wanna give you the fill in the blank with a concept. We say things like, God, that's not fair. God, I was born too tall. I was born too short. I was not born as attractive. God, that person didn't get cancer. That person's kids are walking with the Lord. That person did not have a divorce. Why me? It's so unfair. So y'all know we get this fairness thing flying through our heads. Fair according to what? You see, the fill in the blank on the sheet in front of you is this. The creator sets the purpose. The creator sets the purpose. When something is created for a purpose, it's right to use it for that regardless of other options. What do I mean? I mean that when we say something is unfair, we're saying that there is a standard above God called fairness, justice, that God has to adhere to. There is nothing above God. What he does, by definition, is right. Whether or not we consider it fair or not, fairness doesn't make any sense when talking about God. Why? He is the definition of fair, right? So here's the problem. I think because God is so consistent that when he disrupts a pattern, we call it unfair. 
For example, he keeps giving you breath in your lungs. So when he stops, you say it's unfair. He keeps cancer out of your body despite our attempts every day to put more cancer in our bodies. And when he stops, we call it unfair. In other words, whatever is a disruption pattern, we say, God, you're wrong. And he says, hold on, I'm in charge. If I disrupt my patterns, that's my business. I'm allowed to do that because I'm the one that's making this whole thing run. So stop telling me I'm bad or wrong because I do not fulfill your vision for me. Does that make sense? Ah, that's what we're gonna come head to head with today. All right, turn with me to Job 38, verse one. Job 38, verse one. I entitled today's message, The Only Opinion That Matters. And some of you think that I named it that because I meant me. Uh, that is incorrect, I actually meant God. So the only opinion that matters is God, certainly not me. Here we go, Job 38, one. Then Yahweh, Interesting, your Bible says Lord, does it not? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, if you are new to Christianity or the Bible, every time it says it in all caps, that is the personal name of God. The reason they do not put Yahweh in there is because they, do, they know neither the spelling or correct pronunciation of it, and out of respect for the proper name of God that he revealed to Moses, they put Lord, all right? so. Just so you know, I'll sometimes say Lord, sometimes I'll say Yahweh. Same thing here. Then Yahweh answered Job out of the what? Whirlwind. And said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Uh-oh, that sounds like a beatdown. <laughs> Does it not? Here's what God says. Who do you think you are? You've been throwing around opinions about me for months. You've been telling other people what you think about me. You're telling me I'm a bad guy. You're a bad dad. You're a bad leader. How dare you? You're using these phrases, whether you say them out loud or in your mind, who do you think you are? I know who I am. I'm God. Do you know who you are? You are a creation. Let's be real clear. Do you realize that we have a tremendous imbalance in our view of what God is like? today. Let me give you an example. Back in, as we're turning through 1800s to the 1900s, early 1900s, up through kind of 1950, there was a view of a high and lifted up God. Everything was about respect. Everything was about awe of God is big. You come into church, you better dress right, you better act right. Everything's about obedience. Do not mess up because God is big. He's the big man upstairs, right? And he is far away. And if he comes down here, it's gonna have some serious problems. Now, there are good and bad about that. The good is the respect and awe. The fear of God was better and higher. Can we agree? Here's the problem you can't have a personal relationship with a faraway God. So we kept saying this phrase, God is personal and he wants a relationship with you, but then we made him far away and scary. Well, that kind of ruins the whole thing. Nobody knows how to have a relationship. They know how to be a servant. They just don't know how to be a child. So we all collectively said, that's not going to work. So we swung, swung the pendulum way too far on the other side. So coming through the 60s, all the way up through the 2000s, we now have Jesus being your buddy that you hang out with, and it doesn't matter what you do, 
everything's grace and God just needs to understand. Have you noticed this? Now there's good and bad to that. When you read in the Bible that we are to call him Abba, Father, Daddy, it makes more sense. You can wrestle with him on the floor. You can play with him. You can joke around with him. He called his disciples my friends. And so you drive in the car and joke around about other people's driving skills with your friend. Make sense? Jesus is hanging with you. That's good. That's personal relationship. What's the cost? The lack of the fear of God, the lack of awe. And what we did was reduce God so small is now we're all anxious because he's not big enough to deal with our problems. If you make God manageable in your mind, he's not big enough to save you. Are we all tracking on that? All right, all right. So this imbalance, God was writing an imbalance in Job's mind and he came to re-rack him. So that's where we're gonna pick it up. He's going to take him through this universe tour to let God know you don't know who you're messing with. You neither know me, nor do you know you. So I'm gonna read through this and I just want you to listen because I'm gonna be jumping to make it smoother and you won't be able to follow along with me, all right? Here we go, we're gonna begin in Job 38.4 but you don't need to worry too much because I'll leave you in the dust here in a second. Here's what he said, Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the angels, the sons of God, shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea? with doors when it burst from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Declare to me if you know all this. You know, for you were born then, right? And the number of your days is great. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or have seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war. What is the way to the place where light is distributed or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Can you send forth lightning? Can you hunt the prey for a lion or satisfy the appetite of their young cubs when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven and its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars and spreads his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? And the Lord said to Job, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer now. Ye, <laughs> right? Man, that's hardcore. That's intense. God just shows up and blows him right out of the water. Who are you? I know who I am. You see, I make stuff you can't even fathom. I'm running stuff you don't even understand. And you're gonna come at me like that? You're going to find fault in me when you can't even understand what I make. 
I'm sorry, who do you think you are again? Wow, that's pretty humbling, is it not? God is the creator and sustainer of life. Uh, how many of you have heard of the watchmaker analogy? Anybody heard of the watchmaker analogy? Okay, some of you. Now, you, you'll probably hear the story and know. When people argue the existence of God, it's a very common story to use. And it goes like this. Imagine you're walking through a field and you find a watch that tells time. You pick up the watch and you see all the intricate workings the first thing you're going to do is not say, wow, what an accident of nature. You're going to pick up the watch and go, who manufactured this? This is beautiful. This is intricate. In the same way, in our universe, you have a planet called Earth that everything is finely tuned for life. You don't go walking through the universe and go, wow, what an accident. No one says that. You pick it up and you go, who made this? Clearly with this design, there is a designer. Are we all following? Okay, so that's a normal story. Here's where that analogy falls short. In our story, we found a watch that had been abandoned. God never leaves. So back in the day, especially at the time when America was coming to be, there was a big view called deism. Deism was the idea that there is a God, but he wound up the universe, made beautiful systems, and then bailed out. So there is no personal God, there is just a God. That is not the God of the Bible. You see, God is not just the creator of life, He's the sustainer of life, which means he is actively participating in his creation at every moment. He is the nuclear power that is holding all matter together. He's the one that is deeper to hold the atoms together that holds us together. He is the one that feeds the animals. He is the one that runs the cycles just because he is beautifully organized and consistent doesn't mean he took off. It just means he's beautifully organized and consistent. Y'all with me? All right, so something wonderful about the book of Job which I would suggest to you before this series, probably none of us use Job as a devotional book. Amen? <laughs> and you wanna know why? Because most of you thought that if you read the book of Job, you're gonna get his heebie-jeebies on you. <laughs> I don't wanna do some devotion on some dude where he loses everything because now I'm gonna jinx it. Now something bad's gonna happen to me, right? Okay, that's called magical thinking and superstition right? Please stop doing that. You're allowed to read wherever you want in the Bible, okay? But right in the middle of a book that we think is about suffering, but now we've learned is about God, is some of the most beautiful poetic description of God's might, power, and creation. For example, he said, where were you when I set this entire universe up and every time I did something, all the angels would go, oh, right? They were watching and I'm making this system and they're like, dang, I didn't even know that was possible, right? And then I would make that animal and they're like, oh, that's so weird, <laughs> right? The angels were watching the whole time and they're so impressed and glory was rising and rising and rising and the angels were so fired up. And right there, he said, do you walk in the recesses of the deep? Because I do. Here's what he meant. Hey, human beings, real quick. So do you know what's at the bottom of your ocean? Nope, you don't. I do. Even with your little technology, there's a whole bunch of the ocean you haven't even explored yet. I got fish that'll bite your face off. <laughs> but you don't even know about them yet. You will, but you gotta go deeper. I already know what's down there. You wanna talk about outer space? Oh, look at that. You're sending little rockets out, aren't you? <laughs> Do you got your little Hubble telescope? 
Yeah, you can see super far, huh? Wait till you get further. You know what else I got out there? It'll blow your mind. I walk there. I made that. You don't even know how to see it. And this whole business about what's inside the earth, you're a joke. I know what's in the earth. Every time you're teaching in elementary school, the earth has a core. <laughs> there is hot magma all the way around it. On the top, there is a mantle. The mantle are the different plates. And then earthquake time, it's plate tectonics and it moves and shifts, right? Isn't this what you were taught? Do you know that's a guess? We have no idea what's in our planet. We have no technology to go far enough. We have no idea what's in the core of our own planet. God's like, oh, 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 I do. <laughs> yeah. You don't even know how to examine my creation, but you think you know me. Hmm. Do you feed the animals? Here's the funny thing. When the little birdies in the nest are like, bah, 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 I don't know why they sound like that. Bah, 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 bah. This is their little beak. Y'all follow me? Okay. He said, when they do that little thing, they're like, oh, I want a regurgitated worm. That would be awesome, right? <laughs> you know who they're talking to? Me. You know who organizes? Oh, look, there's a worm up on the ground. It got washed up there. I wonder how that happened. I'm feeding them. I'm that guy. You all think that it's just random. It's not random. I'm doing it all. Hmm. What do you say when God comes at you like that? I'm gonna tell you what Job said, you ready? You can turn with me to Job 40, verse three. Here you go. When God walks into the room, here's what you're going to say. In case you guys need to prep. Job 40, verse three. Then Job answered Yahweh and said, behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. Ready for the translation? I, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> there you go. That's a proper response. You got nothing to say. This whole business where you're going to puff out your chest and, man, when God shows up, I'm going to be like, why did you do that? You know what you're going to do? You're going to soil yourself. That's what you're going to do. And then you're going to fall over. That's what you're going to do. This whole arrogance, I'm going to demand. You're not going to demand anything. You see God for who he is? Wow. That's power right there. So Job says, I have nothing to say. Because everything's cool until he shows up. We can complain all we want. We can say whatever we want. And most of us won't verbalize it. We just store it in our heart and our mind, do we not? And yet the Bible says our thoughts are laid bare before him. You're saying it in the spirit out loud. Everything you're critiquing him, everything you're saying against him, everything you're complaining about, all of that is verbal to the heavens. And we think one day I'm gonna have to own up to that. Nope, you own up to it right now. You said it out loud. God is with us. Okay, in the 1600s, there was a monk by the name of Brother Lawrence. Many of you have probably read his material. The only reason you know his material is because a friend of his betrayed his confidence and published his material. Brother Lawrence was a dishwasher in a monastery. And the reason why he became known was because everyone took notice of this guy because he seemed to have what everyone else was longing for. He had this tremendous peace. He had this power of God. He had the shalom everyone else wanted. And they said, what is your secret? To which, of course, he scoffed and said, that's absurd. I'll be very clear with you. I live every day, whether I'm washing dishes or I'm praying, as if God's right here. That's it. There's nothing fancy about it. That man published his works under a book called Practicing the Presence of God. Now, for most of us, we look at that and we say, ooh, that's good. That's deep. I should 
live my life as if God was with me at all times. That would make me feel better. But doesn't it also mean that if God is right there, you should have continual awe, respect, and fear of God? Because he's right there. You're not saying it and then later answering for it. You're saying it to him right now. All right, but God's not done. He has more to say. We pick it up in chapter 40, verse 6. Then Yahweh answered Job out of the what? Whirlwind. And said, dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Man, that's convicting. Here's what he just said. Are you so self-focused that you're going to reason out how I'm wrong just so you feel right? Is that what you're gonna do? You're gonna spin the scenario to where somehow I did it wrong, but now you feel better because you're right. Are you? I thought I was God. I'm never wrong. I'm always right. If you can't figure out what I'm doing, you're missing some pieces. You're in the wrong, not me. What's his bottom line to Job? You're not in charge here. I'm in charge here, right? You are simply one of my creations. Now, let me share with you a nugget that came to me in different conversations, different books I read, but I put the pieces together. God comes to Job in a what? I keep saying that, yeah? Why is that important? Um, what killed all of Job's kids? A wind. You think that's an accident? No. God in the Old Testament comes in many forms. Sometimes he comes in smoke. Sometimes he comes in fire. Sometimes he comes in clouds. Why would he come in wind when all of his children were killed by wind? That seems a bit odd. Seems a bit rude, does it not? Why? Well, let me give you another story. In John chapter 9, there's a man born blind. Jesus is going through, and he wants to heal this guy, right? Now, he comes up to this guy, and he wants to be able to see. So Jesus takes him just outside to where there's some more dirt, and do you remember what he does? <laughs> spits, I did not spit, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> spits right into the dirt and makes mud and puts it on his eyes. Now, is that the only way to heal somebody that's blind? Nope, as a matter of fact, that's the only time that that's recorded like that, right? Why would he do that? Well, let me give you a side note. Do you realize that in that culture, if you were born with a handicap, people spit in your direction? So this guy, all of his life, has heard the sound, <laughs> and it always meant rejection. Why would God use the same method to heal him? Right, and everyone's like, please stop making that sound. That is so unsettling. <laughs> okay, I get it, I'm done, I'm done. Why would he do that? Because here's how human nature works. When we have a trauma, we never wanna see it again. We want to put it away in a neighborhood and run far away, and we will never ever return to that neighborhood. That neighborhood is dead to us. We're okay with being limited and being imprisoned from that place. God is not. He is not afraid of what we're afraid of. And he will not allow his children to be blocked from anywhere. He said, who I set free will be free indeed. Therefore, I know you're cool with running away. I'm not. My children don't run. My children are delivered. 
and he will take the very thing that was the source of your sorrow and keep having you engage with it over and over and over until there's victory. That's not what we want. But man, doesn't he do that? Like you have church wounds, right? Because you were a part of a church where the leader misused funds, stole stuff from you, and you haven't been back to church since. The first time you return to church is giving weekend for a building project. (laughs) It happens every time. Is that an accident? No! God is saying that which caused you wounds, I will use for redemption. Because my children will be free indeed. Uh, I think that he came in a whirlwind because Job didn't like wind anymore. I think that he always played that scenario. There were my kids at a birthday party and a wind came up and knocked the building down and they all died. I can imagine as he's sitting outside and a wind blows by, he's not comforted. He's reminded of pain. And God shows up and says, I come in wind. I'm there too. You're gonna miss a piece of me if you leave that unresolved. You see, I'm everywhere. All right, let's move forward. Then God gets a little bit weird, okay? Now, that's not new. He starts talking about two of his critters that he has made. He talks about two particular monstrous animals. One is called the behemoth. The other is called Leviathan. All right, so I'm gonna read these two and then we'll talk about what they're like. All right, here we go. I'm in Job 40, verse 15, but I'm gonna be jumping around. Here we go. Job, behold behemoth, which I made just like I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold, his strength is in his loins, his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar tree. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. He is the first of the works of God. Let him who made him bring near his sword. Under the lotus plants of the river he lies, in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. Can anyone pierce his nose with a snare? All right, we all getting a picture? Okay, that's Behemoth. Let's go to Leviathan. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will you play with him as with a bird or put a leash on him for your girls? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? If you lay your hands on him, you'll remember the battle and you'll never do it again. No one is so fierce that they would dare stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who would come near to Leviathan with a bridle? Around his teeth is terror. His back is made of rows of shields, shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near the other that no air can come between them. His sneezings flash forth light. His eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. Out of his mouth go flaming torches. Sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils come forth smoke as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals and a flame comes forth from his mouth. In his neck abides strength and terror dances before him. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. Though the sword reaches him, it does not avail, nor the spear or the dart or the javelin. Behind him in the water, he leaves a shining wake. On earth, there is none his like, a creature without fear. All right, we got it? All right, what in the world are these? Yeah? Now, if you look in a commentary, and this is where I get very angry, if you look in a commentary, it says that the behemoth is a hippo. Okay, now, I get it. I did research on hippos. 
Hippos are hardcore, right? I'm not going to dishonor the hippo. The hippo is the third largest land animal. It's massive, yes, big deal. It is the number one killer animal in Africa. It is responsible for 500 deaths a year. So hippos are brutal. Is this a hippo? And everyone's like, it's in the river. It has the ability to destroy. It's massive, blah, blah, blah. It eats grass and all that stuff. Is it a hippo? Well, it says the behemoth's tail is like a cedar tree. Have you ever seen a hippo tail? <laughs> it is perhaps the stupidest thing in nature. It is this little dinky thing that hangs out the back. What is that? Right? Okay, so it's not a hippo. Then you look at Leviathan, and everyone in the commentary said it's a crocodile. A crocodile? You know any fire breathing crocodiles? No way, man, that would be scary. It says when he raises up, have you ever seen the legs of a crocodile? Here's your raise up. <laughs> That, that's all you got. That's your big move, right? You're not rising up anywhere. You're just laying down, dude. All right. So what are these things? We got two choices. Either, number one, they are mythological metaphors. Mythological metaphors. In other words, God is taking characters from popular culture at the time and saying, these represent chaos, I'm bigger than that. Meaning, I'm bigger than anything that would frighten you. Is that what he means? Well, he's obviously, or excuse me, he's especially detailed about his mythological creature. He even says, I made him just like I made you. Well, we're not mythological, we're real creatures. So our only other option is they are real animals that don't exist anymore real animals that don't exist anymore. Now, I've told my girls this since they were little. Here's a rule about human beings. We kill everything big, right? How do I know that? Well, all across America was filled with buffalo. Where are they now? Well, we killed them all. Why? Because we kill big things. What is the problem in Africa? We kill all the elephants. We kill all the rhinos. As a matter of fact, in China, we'll kill all the pandas. We will kill tigers. We kill anything large that either threatens us or we can eat. So our animal kingdom is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Here's my opinion on what Leviathan is. I think Leviathan is what we would call a dragon. Why? Did you see the shields? What does that look like? It sounds like scales, locked, interlocked, all the way around. It breathes fire, and it has, now it's a water dragon, right? And you're like, Nessie, yeah, I knew it, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Loch Ness Monster. Okay, maybe, but here's my point. My point is we don't have it anymore. That the dragon thing got started somewhere. It wasn't just an imagination thing. I think it's gone to mythical proportions where now it's flying and attacking and all this stuff. Okay, I think we've blown it out of proportion, but it started somewhere. We have plenty of dinosaurs that have containers in their heads for combustion where they can fire out fire. I think that's rather impressive. Do you realize though that in every story there's a dragon slayer, right? Why? You kill what's big and threatening. There's never the great story of the dragon petter named Charles. Like there's not, he's like, isn't a picture just petting a dragon? Nobody has that guy. It's always kill the big things. All right, so what I think is that these are real animals that existed in the ancient world, were killed off, but they're being used as a metaphor. So for example, the Bible says Satan, or the devil, is like a lion seeking who he may devour. Lions are real animals. But now, all of a sudden, Satan is like one in a metaphor, and now he's all over the world. Okay, I think that we moved on with a concept, but it was a real thing. All right, are we all good on that? Okay, so let me close this thing out. I want to ask the big, obvious question. 
The big obvious question is, why did God come in so hard on Job? Job just lost all of his family. Job didn't deserve it. Job just lost all of his wealth and ability to produce wealth. Job for months has been sitting with sores all over his body and is waiting to die. And God's response is, who do you think you are? Stand up, answer me. You trying to come at me? You're trying to attack me. You are but a grain of dust in this world, boy. Don't attack me. Why would God come at him like that? Doesn't that seem kind of mean? Because here's how we would do it. Man, you've had a horrific year. We would come next to you and come real slow. We would not try not to scare you, right? And we would tap you on the shoulder and just try to be gentle and say, I'm so sorry. Can I help you out? Isn't that how we would do it? And we go, wow, God is mean. Okay. I think there's two reasons why God came at Job like that. Number one is I think that because he's God and we're not, sometimes he needs to re-rack us. I think he needs to remind creation of their place, and I think that's always appropriate. I think that God needs to restore the fear of God in us because it's the beginning of wisdom. Nothing else will be right until we get God right. Make sense? But I think there's another reason. Number two is it's better for Job. How can it be better for Job? How can God blasting you be better for you? And is everybody clear that when I teach this message, you're like, wow, I learned a lot about Job today. Are we all clear I'm not talking about Job? I'm talking about you. How is it better for us? Okay, let me give you an, uh, an analogy. Anybody ever heard of a compression blanket? A compression blanket, it's a weighted blanket that lays heavy on you. Anybody know what they're for? Let me read a website from a compression blanket manufacturer called Sensacomb. Here's what they said. Our custom weighted blankets can be therapeutic for anyone with anxiety, insomnia, autism, ADHD, PTSD, and sensory processing disorders. Our products can lessen the effects associated with sensory disorders by helping your child sleep through the night, reducing anxiety and stress, easing restlessness and irritability in the elderly, preventing or short-circuiting a meltdown, dot, dot, dot. Okay, doesn't every parent go, I will take three? Yeah, in this room, <laughs> right? Like, I need some of those, right? Uh, some of you may be agitated elderly, and you're like, I want a blanket for me, man, come on. All right, here's the point. Do you know that they have weighted vests for dogs with social anxiety? Everybody know those? The thunder vest, right? So the little doggy's freaking out because you're leaving forever, and so you put the little weighted vest on the dog, and the dog is still shaking. He's like, I think I can handle it now. I think I can handle it now, <laughs> right? Because what's the point? The point is giving them a hug. What hugs do is it clasps in and it's pressure touch and it starts to decompress you. As a matter of fact, when an autistic child, especially the younger ones, begin to go into a meltdown, the ability to surround them and hold them close is healing and pacifying. Do you know that when you have a baby and the baby comes out, the baby is freaking out? Why? I have too much room. Oh my gosh, why are my arms moving like this? Because for nine months, you're like this. You're squished. A compression blanket, a weighted vest, that is a compression womb feel. It means things are all right. It's why you make little baby burritos, right? You swaddle the babies and you roll them super tight so their eyes pop out. <laughs> it's because then the baby feels safe. What do you think God's doing to Job? 
I think Job's having a meltdown. What did he do? He came in and said, knock it off. As long as I let you run with your mind, oh, you're bigger than me, it's all on you, you there, no one can solve your problems, everything's scary, stop. Your mind is freaking you out. Bring it back in, buddy. I'm in charge. The more you think you're in charge, the worse your world gets. So I'm going to re-rack you and shut you down. You know in the movies, which by the way, this does not work, please do not do this. You know in the movies when someone's freaking out and they're like, get yourself together, man, and they start slapping him? Okay, that actually does not help. I'm an anxiety guy, please don't do that to me. <laughs> that concept of stop doing that, bring it back in, that is actually a healing thing. I believe that God said, if I let you go, Job, you're only gonna get worse. I'm gonna put a block on you so you can get traction again. I'm God, you're not, settle down, then we'll talk. Isn't that interesting? Mm. Can I have the prayer team come on up here? You see, God's not like we think he is. He pushes us in ways we would never get pushed. We wanna run away from him and he keeps holding us back while we kick and scream and yell at him and say, leave me alone, he won't. Is that mean or is that parenting? Our God is good. Our God is big. Our God is powerful, but he's so loving. As we close out, our prayer team is up here because as I'm preaching, some of us need a prayer compression blanket. We need somebody to pray over us for us to be reminded that God's in charge and we can let the stress fall away. Maybe you need that today before you go and you would come up and just let them pray a washing over you. Some of you have needs just in general and you've been waiting all week to come to church to get some prayer over that. That's what the altar is for. Let me just close us in prayer and we'll get out of here. Holy Spirit, your ministry is always right. You lead us down roads we would never lead each other. You push us in ways we don't understand. You know what's possible. You're not afraid. You're bold and strong and you're excellent and brilliant and creative. Everything you do, God, is right. Please give us just a tiny glimpse of who you are that our hearts may be re-racked, our minds may be reset, and that we might be more healthy for being near you. Be praised and glorified in Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next time.